people laughed when the, the phrase alternative facts came out, right? And I was like, there's nothing funny about that. You have facts, I have facts. We can look at the same facts and come to two different conclusions. The solutions, the answers, Mark, I have never found to be the problem with the workshops I give with this book. It's that the questions are rarely asked. Most high performing leaders I talk about in my book, they all have this one thing in common. They, they love these three little words, which are, I don't know. Today's guest is a serial entrepreneur, a speaker, and the author of this book right here, Honest to Greatness. Now, if you've ever felt like you have to dance around the truth to save someone else's feelings, or when you are being honest and open with people, they seem to freak out at what you're saying. Or maybe if you're like me and you just feel like you're not 100% honest with yourself all the time, then this episode is for you. Because I talk about all that and a whole lot more with this week's guest, Peter Kozadoy. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. In business and in life, how do you dominate your competitors? How do you achieve wild profitability? And I am as surprised as anyone, Mark, to learn that honesty is the strategy to achieve outcomes in the 21st century. So how does one go about being as honest and, um, and, and respectful as possible, knowing that most people are not actually comfortable with receiving that kind of feedback. You hit the nail on the head. The issue is the element of surprise, is catching people off guard. That's where you lose people, right? There's a, you know, one of the CEOs in my book makes a great point. He says, if you're flying in an airplane and the pilots come over the intercom and they say, well, folks, we've never seen storm clouds like that before. So please put your seatbelts on. Not quite sure if we're going to land this plane, but we're going to try our hardest. Um, you know, is it honest? Yeah, maybe. But is it helpful? No. Right? <laughs> Honesty is only as good as the trust that it creates. That's the purpose here, right? So if you think about giving someone direct feedback that offends their ego, that puts their wall up, that puts them on the defensive, not helpful right? In the same sort of way. And so, you know, I stratify honesty into three different layers in the book, into a framework I call the hourglass of honesty. It's sort of how to turn this into strategy in your life and business. And in the middle layer is getting honest with and about the others around us. Now, the wisdom in this, Mark, is, is understanding what does getting honest with versus about others mean and, and when do you use one or the other, right? Sometimes you need to level with people. You need to say, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. Here's exactly what I'm doing to fix this, et cetera, et cetera. And what do we do? We, we as human beings love that, right? Oh, thank you. Right. We, we appreciate that. It's refreshingly honest, right? Other times we need to be honest about others, about their self-limiting beliefs, their ego, their biases, their doubts and fears and hopes, right? And this is where it's sort of deep empathy comes into play. Uh, this is why you probably don't want to go out and say, hey, you know, the world's on fire and everyone's going to die and cause panic, right? Probably not, again, not helpful, doesn't inspire trust. So one of the things that I encourage my clients to do and then, you know, folks in my workshops is direct feedback is wonderful. Uninvited direct feedback is the problem. That's the enemy. And every time, Mark, I say, you know, I, oh, gosh, I have a reaction to this, but I don't want to share it because I don't want to offend you. And then you'll hate me. What do people say 100% of the time? No, no, no. I can, I can take it. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, right. They have psychologically lowered their wall on their own to allow me to be direct and honest about it. Works like a charm. The problem is we don't ask, we don't get permission. That's an example of being honest about the others. Another quick thing, you know, I'll tell you tactically is you will never hear me say you should, right? I have banned those words from my vocabulary. And the reason is if you ask me for advice, I don't know what the you should do. I'm not in your head. I don't know all the million variables that are going on in your life and business. Who am I to tell you what you should do? And yet at the next COVID friendly party you go to, listen and look around for some idiot telling someone else, you should do this and you should do that. And watch the body language of the person receiving that. They're shrinking, they're coming back, they're shutting down. This is just psych 101, right? There's all kinds of reasons why people fail to face truths. One, I mean, the, 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 the harder the truth is, the more you have to take ownership over past decisions you made, over areas that you're not maybe living up, uh, your own shortcomings, your own failures. I mean, is that 
the ultimate reason why people tend to gloss over these things or are there other reasons that people politely lie to everyone all the time? Well, it's, you know, what we have to ask ourselves, what's the antithesis of honesty, right? And it, it is, uh, it's ego, it's bias, um, it's self-limiting belief, it's assumptions that simply aren't true. Um, you know, I'll skip ahead to the the tactical piece of all this and, and give you, you know, a question that can literally instantly change your life and business, which is, you know, two questions. One, is that true? And two, how do I know? Mm -hmm. And this applies to, you know, whether it's a headline in the news or your great aunt Millie's Facebook post or a thought you have in your head, just stop and ask, is that true? And how do I know? Because let me tell you, Mark, you know, I've worked now with hundreds of entrepreneurs helping them build their own million dollar company. And I will tell you 99% of business problems are personal problems in disguise. They are some fundamental untruth that an entrepreneur has told themselves. That's just not true. It's just like, and they're operating from that basis, right? So how, like, we wonder how we end up like the leaning tower of Pisa, the, the foundation is fundamentally incorrect. And that's why it's so critical that we, that, you know, and that's what I'm, why I'm so proud of this book, honestly, yeah. Mark, like I, this I is it. fundamental stuff. If we get the fundamental stuff wrong, then we're never going to get to where we're trying to go. I love it. I, I um, am often taking people through brand strategy, um, perhaps similar to you. And one of the questions that I love to ask, so I always, I always try to get uh, um, clarity from someone as to whether they're over indexing, how, how good they are, or if they're actually under indexing. And I find for entrepreneurs, they're typically over indexing. And for people who work in corporate environments, they're often under indexing, just how magical this could really be if they, if they just were more bold. Um, so one of the questions I always ask is, are we as good as we think? Like, I know you think you're good, but are we actually as good as you think they are? And I typically get a response with, which is like, well, listen, you know, like, are we perfect? No, we're not perfect, but you know, we're pretty darn this and we're pretty darn that. And we did it. And they just, they just skate around. Hey, you know, like you think you're great, but your operations suck. Your delivery sucks. Um, your customer service is terrible. Uh, there, people don't understand what you're saying. There's no clarity of message. There's no proper value prop. The pricing is off. Like, like, endless ways that people ignore these things in business. Yeah. And so when you start to focus this, like, you know, is it true? And how do we know it's true? How do you or the people that you're that are reading this book, how do they not got, get lost in the spiral of this? I hope they do. That's the idea <laughs> is for them to question everything, right? Um, but eventually you, know, I, you have to move forward, right? Action, action must take place. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And what, you know, all, here's the thing, right? Most of us, I'm going to say all, right? Some of us are like pathological, right? But most normal people, they know they know the truth, right? Um, and if I, I find, you know, in my own coaching, for instance, that if I confront someone just to pause and ask, like, why do you think that? Or if that belief were wrong, how might it be wrong? And, and why do you think you would have gotten there? And, and just having that, you know, alternative look at it usually is enough to dislodge them. This stuff is not difficult. The, the solutions, the answers, Mark, I have never found to be the problem with the workshops I give with this book. It's that the questions are rarely asked because we get stuck in our lies. Like you ask about stuck, you know, stuck, right? Or, or getting in the vortex. We're all in the vortex. You know, <laughs> these things are designed to dislodge and kick you out. I've never had someone be like, well, now that I know exactly what I want, how do I get there? That's ne like, I've never had that. It's, it's mostly, oh, that's what I want. Hmm. Oh. But do you not find that people aren't, you know, now that the path is clear in front of them and, and they know the steps that they have to take, they don't want it bad enough. They don't take the steps. They blame something else. I mean, is that not? 100%, but, but, that's, but that's back to the, you know, it, I get this like, I don't know what I really want. That's not true. Everyone knows what they really want. They're want either scared really to want. admit it to themselves <laughs> or it's society has told them that they, they should want something else or mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. Like, so when you say like they don't work hard at, well, then they were lying about what they really wanted anyway, because if someone really honestly wants something and they're honest about what it takes to get there, then the getting there is, is not terribly difficult. It's the people who, I mean, listen, I coach some delusional entrepreneurs that they don't make any money and they're like, I'm going to be a billionaire someday. And I'm like, well, you're deluded right? Mm -hmm. So let's dial that back. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> how do we make a, uh, you know, a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year? Let's start there. Right. right. Um, and, and so there's this sort of thing that, that people get way out in front of their skis. That's not honest either. 
Um, and, and again, what does that come back to? Bias, ego, et cetera, et cetera. So one, one thing that I had to work on um, and, and still have to work on, but so I was told when I was a teenager and even into my 20s that I was really black and white and really direct. Hmm. And being so direct, uh, you know, with people, they found it intimidating. They, um, you know, I've learned this over the years when you just get these random comments like, oh, I was really intimidated by you when I first met you. And I was like, really? Why? I'm, I'm the most approachable guy in the world. Um, but but it, so so I, I picked up along this way all of these bad habits to couch comments, to hedge comments, to add all of this context, to explain everything as to blah, blah, blah. And it made sense to me, but, but in all of the hedging, there was a lack of clarity and people didn't really, you know, I thought they understood what I was saying, reading between the lines, but they didn't. And then I would eventually have to be brutally honest with them or surprise them or catch them off guard anyway. Uh, so, so I always kind of have named myself now the mayor of hedge city. And for the last <laughs> three years, I've been really working where people like in my life have to say, Mark, that's a hedge, right? Like, like you're being polite. Why don't you just tell me what you really think? Um, but now I'm more likely to make people cry. I'm more likely to make people feel bad. I'm more likely to do all of these things. Dude, I, I am resonating with you right now. I, I told you earlier, right? Mo most likely to continue being a that was me. People tell me I'm intimidating. I'm five foot seven. I was a former figure skater for God's sake. I mean, come on, intimidating, <laughs> but I do, you know, th right. this is apparently who I am. And so that's, you know, up to me to listen and, and to accept that. It took me a lot of years of saying, what are you talking about? Like, I'm as friendly as ever. That by the way, was a lie apparently, right? Doesn't matter what I think. That's my ego talking it matters what people around me are mm. thinking. And that again is part of being honest. Yeah. You've touched on on my team, I found, gosh, maybe, maybe maybe eight, nine years ago, I found we kept bumping into the same things. And so I developed five questions I wanted my team to ask myself. But one of them, and, and it's a playoff PR, but it's that perception is truth. It's just, it's just a principle perception is truth. Let's, you know, I want to come back to one of the important things you said, which is different kinds of people, right? You have people who don't want to offend others. We have research showing how positive reinforcement is so good, right? It encourages people versus, you know, negative feedback and all that. But I don't want people to misunderstand. The only reason that's true is because of our delicate egos. Let's remember that when we can't be direct with one another, we lose, right? We lose time. We lose the opportunity to really actually understand, you know, where, where we are. And that is a loss. I want people to understand that. And there are cultures out there like Bridgewater Associates, right? Largest hedge fund in the world that have recognized this and built a culture of saying, no, like it's up to eat. We have the personal responsibility to let our ego go. We need to be direct with each other. Why? Because there are literally tens of billions of dollars riding on whether you and I figure out the bottom of this issue, right? not how we feel about it and all this other crap. So, you know, what I'm hoping with this bookmark is, is two things. One, that I can help people get brutally honest about how big the egos are on the other side of the table, right? And how do we do, take the tactics that I shared earlier and soften ourselves to the point where we are getting our point across and achieving outcomes together. And also, I want everyone to realize how much of an egotistical, narcissistic person they are. And- and, and let that go because, you know, listen, I was raised on the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? That's really helpful when we start talking about truth, being honest with one another, getting to the bottom of issues, agreeing on an objective reality or as close as we can get to it. We live in a world now where, where word, every word is parsed and every word is offensive. And I would argue that that's not helping anyone, right? Not helping our society. We have a bunch of people who have actually raise their level of ego. And it, it is now we all have your living your truth, right? We have mm -hmm. 7 billion people each living their truth. Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me how that's sustainable, right? It, eventually, that is not going to, to work. So, you know, these are all the big and, you know, that's one of the, the categories I talk about with honesty is being honest with and about the community, right? All these movements happening. And, you know, I'm telling you sort of how I'm seeing them and how I feel about them what I'm asking people to do, and, and I'm doing this because we're on a podcast, right? But ordinarily, I'd, I'm pretty strict about like, we have to accept these things, right? I don't know where I picked this up, but I heard someone, maybe it was in a movie, maybe it was in TV. I don't remember where it was. Oh, gosh, let me get the quote right. It was something like, there's no, um, there's no bad facts or, um, you know, like there's, there's nothing 
there's nothing evil with truth. Like it's just like all truth is good truth. All facts are good facts. It was something along those lines. And that always stuck with me because I want to be the person who's accepting of that. And the more I come to empathize and understand and learn, the more progressive I become, the more open uh, we are to others and everything else. But culture aside, you know, U.S. culture aside, uh, European, wherever you might be, how, how do we get more people to be open to the facts of the facts? You know, well, so, you know, let's talk big and then we'll go micro, right? I, we're all seeing, and by we, I mean, I mean everyone, but I, I think especially young people are seeing what's happened, how fractured the truth has become. You know, all, people laughed when the, the phrase alternative facts came out, right? And I was like, there's nothing funny about that. You have facts, I have facts. We can look at the same facts and come to do two different conclusions. We can mm-hmm. feel differently about the same facts, right? Like all of this gray area exists. And I don't know that our society has until now grappled with all the gray area there is among this idea of truth. Uh, I actually read a super interesting article in Wired or, I don't know, one of those like magazines that make me sound like a total dork, but it was about how even math, which people, you know, usually say is the truth of the capital T, right, is a construct of humanity and, you know, so on and so forth. So it's subject to different errors. I thought that was fascinating. Um, so, you know, when I talk about getting to an objective truth, I also say as close as possible, right? Which is how, by the way, again, outcomes, the leaders and organizations in my book end up dominating their industries because they come to this common understanding, which is, I think, something that we're not seeing in society, societies, um, you know, particularly here in America now, you mentioned the election. I think we're seeing how dangerous it is. And I think we will naturally say like, okay, well, that's a mess, right? (laughs) Let's maybe try to move away from that and, and return to truth. And that's the whole premise of the book on a macro scale is that, you know, it's funny, people say to me like, Peter, what are you talking about? I mean, since since 2008, it's been scandal after scandal and Jeffrey Epstein and Trump and like all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you're proving my point, which is that 50 years ago, we wouldn't have known any of that, right? It would have just stayed in the dark. But it would have yeah. still happened. <laughs> exactly, right? We live in the 21st century. What's what's different here is that there is no, there's a dwindling information asymmetry, right? Which is this idea that you had information that I didn't have and therefore you had the power. Now everybody's got a smartphone. Everything's being recorded. It's such a transparent world and getting more transparent. The whole premise of the book is that it, it's no longer going to pay to do anything but be honest and transparent. So that's on the macro scale, right? Now the question is, what do you do on the micro scale? You asked about friends and family, right? Let me, let me put this to you, Mark. Have you ever seen the following scenario where uh, someone takes issue with someone else and and that person says, I can't believe that you think this way, that you feel this way. Everything you're saying and thinking is wrong and you need to change and have that person go like, oh my God, you're so right. I can't believe I was such an idiot. And all this time I was thinking this and really I should have been that. Thank you so much for illuminating that for me. That has never happened in the history of humanity. Am I right? Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, so then the question is, well, how do we encourage change? There was a wonderful story that I heard. uh, I I can't remember where. It just, it like struck me to the core. It was a, a, a white guy and a black guy. They were neighbors. And the white guy was like a clear racist. Okay. Like admitted this. And uh, they had, you know, a terrible relationship, obviously, until uh, the, the white gentleman landed in the hospital. And after a couple of days, you know, you, you, you kind of come, came to his senses enough to realize that there was someone else in the room and that other person was his black gentleman neighbor hmm. stuck in the same hotel, uh, hospital room together. And so, you know, on the first day, they didn't speak a word to each other, right? And the second day, not a word to each other. Third day, fourth day, finally a week goes by. And nurse comes in, opens the curtain for the morning, delivers breakfast. And the the white guy looks over and he sort of gives the, you know, his neighbor a little nod, right? Fine. This goes on for a couple of weeks. Then eventually, uh, you know, the the black guy gets uh, his, you know, pudding, realizes that white guy didn't get his, says, hey, you know, why don't you take this? I know you love it. It's a favorite part of your meal. Do you want it? Says, yeah, okay, sure. Takes the pudding. And over the course of several weeks, they actually develop a relationship. And this white guy comes out, denounces 
every racist group he's ever been in and completely changes his ways, flip sides and realizes that he needs to help this problem, right? not be part of the problem. Now, how does that happen? It doesn't happen by the endless people that went by this guy's house and said, how can you be such a horrible human being? How can you be so racist? You need to change. It doesn't work that way, right? Instead, they needed to realize that they were both human beings, right? This racist white guy needed to understand that his neighbor was a human, right? And have a human connection. This is what's missing from all of the disagreements we're having. For some reason, and this, and this is something I teach in my workshops, like when someone disagrees with you, just shut up and listen to them and then ask them, tell me more about that viewpoint. What are you watching? What are you looking at? What kind of data are you seeing? What's your life experience that's helped you form that view? Help me understand. Can you imagine how different of a world we would have if we took that open-minded, much more honest approach to you know, getting to the bottom of our humanity? It's not difficult, right? It just takes what? A lack of ego, which is a lot of what comprises this whole idea of, of being brutally honest, not only with others, but, but with ourselves, Mark. I mean, what do you think of that? Well, it remind, I, I, I think that's totally true. I mean, the two thoughts that come to mind is one, boy, that seems like a lot of work for someone that you don't respect or like. <laughs> so, so I think most people would rather just, you know, it's the person who gives you the finger and this and that, because it's just like, they just don't even care enough about the person. Uh, so I, I hope that with our friends and family, we'd be able to overcome that. But the other thing it reminds me of is, uh, you know, I've, I've been with my wife for 20 years now. We met, she was 16, I was 17. We started dating in high school. We've been married for 15. I think I'm pretty good at being married. And I think <laughs> I can give really great marriage advice. And up until about five years ago. And uh, I've been running my business for 14 years. I built a multi-million dollar company. I think I can give, I, I used to think I can give really great business advice. You talked about this, right? Not giving advice, but giving life experience. Mm -hmm. And then it hit me where most of my advice was like, oh, I'm really good at being, you know, being married to my wife. And, oh, I'm really good at running my business the way that I found success in my market with my team doing my thing. And some of that just isn't transferable. Like some of it's universal, but a lot of it is like, I can't just hand you what worked for me because it may not work for you, as you said. 100%. Yeah, and you know, I think the one of the big key words here is curiosity. You know, the, the most high performing leaders I talk about in my book, mm. they all have this one thing in common. They, they love these three little words, which are, I don't know. They love it. You know, they're just like, I have no idea. I'm an idiot. I mean, literally, this is the place that these people operate from. Warren Buffett, the uh, head of Quicken Loans and the Ritz-Carlton and Domino's Pizza, and they all share the same thing, which is we have no idea, but gosh, we love learning, right? Love learning how we're wrong, love learning what, what you know, is changing out there. That's the secret, just being honest enough to know that we don't know, mm. right? It, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't agree with you. I think it's simple and easy. And, you know, Think, I'm not think. saying it's not simple and easy. I'm saying that in my experience, listen, I lost 50 pounds in two years. Nobody wants to hear the story because everybody on the podcast has heard it before. <laughs> well, Everything that I did was simple and easy though, right? You're not sleeping well at night. In most cases, the changes you can make to sleep properly at night are simple and easy. You want to come to understand your neighbor or your coworker or your friend or someone better. It's, it's not hard don't you just think people are lazy? <laughs> yeah. People are hundred percent lazy. That's a, it's a huge, that's a huge problem. People are lazy. So how do we, uh, if, if, you know, you're an evangelist, a, an honesty evangelist, I'll call you, you know, uh, I can, I've I, been called worse. So I'll let it run. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I, uh, all right. In America evangelist means something else, maybe, but, uh, an honesty evangelist. I'm a, you know, someone who wants to, 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 you know, no longer be the mayor of Hedge City and learn how to be able to be more honest with people in respectful ways. But once we start to get on board with this, we think this is a secret answer for everything. So, you know, how do we get others to be able to, uh, to also pick up on it and run with it when they might go like, yeah, I just don't care that much. I'm appealing to microeconomics here. Again, this is not an ethics book. This is a, how do I achieve outcomes in my life or business book. And I'm not in the business of motivating people to achieve outcomes for themselves that they don't want to work hard for. Right. Mm. So, you know, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Either want it, pick the book up, read it and implement it. 
or, or don't. I can't help okay. you. <laughs> right. It's like, I already built a multi-million dollar company, right? It's like, listen, I'm telling you the things I've learned mm-hmm. and take them or leave them uh, to, to do anything else. Mark, I think would be a reflection of my own ego, right? I'm going to go motivate the masses and no, I'm, I'm not going to do any of that. If the masses don't want to be motivated, mm-hmm. I'm looking for people who look around and think to themselves, well, do I have the life that I want? No. Okay, well, maybe I'm not being honest about who I really am, not being honest about what I really want, not being honest about what it's going to take to get there, and so on and so forth. This stuff is not rocket science. It's like I said, I've been shocked to see that the questions are rarely even asked at that deep of a level. Mm. So what does motivate you then? Like, you know, you're you're four years post journey of the transition point for 30, 18 months of crazy, crazy progress. You're now, you know, the book is out. Uh, you know, you're speaking a lot. It's a wild ride, but so what is it that's, that's motivating you right now? Yeah. You know, you're catching me at a very interesting time to ask that question because uh, it took about four years to go from start to finish of my entire, like big AF goals that I set for myself at 30, one of them being the book. Right. Mm -hmm. And there were tons of others. And so literally like four years, almost exactly. It was like, okay, well, cross the last thing off the list. Um, now what the hell do I do, right? <laughs> uh, and, I've, and so I'm in this reassessment period. So it's funny you should ask. And one of the things I keep coming back to that I'm now thinking about every day is what's really important here. Hmm. Literally, I ask myself that every day, what's really important here? You know, Because when you achieve all the big things you want in life, then I think it's, uh, what I found is it's a great opportunity for, for me to reflect on what's bigger, right? What's bigger than that? I keep asking myself, like, what would be even better? What would be even better? What would be even better? What's next? Yeah. Which is funny because, you know, in a lot of the coaching I do, I, or I'll do workshops, right? Here's a great example. An entrepreneur will be, I'll be like, design your perfect day. Okay. Well, someone raises their hand, stands up. Peter, I'll tell you, my perfect way to work would be I work four hours a day, five days a week. Man, that would be so good. You know, right now I'm working 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I just want, four hours a day, five days a week. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a great goal. Like, holy, that is awesome. Hey, uh, you know, just have a question for you. Why don't you want to work one hour a day, one day a week? And they're like, well, I mean, yeah, I would love that, but that's not possible. I say, oh, really? Oh, really? Who told you that, right? Is that true? How do you know? Um, So, you know, I'm in that phase of thinking to myself, you know, I want to spin up another business. My business partner and I are looking for a great SaaS idea right now, right? Um, to build off of our agency. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about how to better support my wife, right? You know about this. That's a job too. That's a job I've probably only taken as seriously as I should in the past several years of going through this whole honest journey, right? I think it's easy for us to forget. I ask myself, how do I be a better son to my parents? You know, what really matters here? And it's those things. I think about, I don't know if you've ever done like the 83 year old question where it's like, you're 83 looking back, what did you do? What did you feel? What did you accomplish? Such a different perspective. And it puts mm-hmm. things into a very different context. And I've done a heck of a job, Mark, and you probably have gone through this too, of really listing everything I do in my days or in my companies that I don't like and just getting rid of it. Just stop doing it. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> and finding a better, happier, more fulfilling way, right? Which are, by the way, out there. It's only us that decide there's not a better, easier, more fulfilling way, right? So, you know, all of these things I'm, I'm doing in my life right now. I love it. I love the transition moment because I found, you know, every three to four years myself, you know, you're facing that transition. I try, I try not to, to face it every six to 12 months because then you fall in the, 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 the rapid prototyping, never getting anything done type of thing. But yeah, yeah every three or four years, you know, when someone asks me about business or about growth or about anything, I, I always have to say like, well, what point of time do you want to hear about? Because, totally. because, you know, year seven of my business, it's different than year 10. It's different than the last three years has been hell man. The last six months, <laughs> yeah, you right. know, this business year. has been also very different. So, mm-hmm. so I, I love, I love the uh, transition period you're in. How do you feel then? I mean, if you're looking at these things, how do you, What's the question here? It's, I think that I would get um, burdened. I would, I would feel overburdened by looking at, okay, wife, son, business, new opportunities, cross these goals off, this and this and this. And, and it would start to stack up and I'd go, 
well, I couldn't possibly achieve the level that I would want to bring to everything. Um, and so I, I would potentially get stuck in that. You, you know, based on your childhood, based on, based on sports, based on um, all of the things that you've achieved, you, you, you seem to be the type of person who can really knock things out, set a goal, work on that goal and knock things out. Do you not get lost in the, in the, well, I'm not as good of a son as I could be. So I'm going to do these things, but these things, if I'm investing here, it's actually costing me over there. How do you manage all that while you're figuring out what you're going to do next? I spent a lot of years feeling guilty about the shark tank advice of how can an entrepreneur focus on more than one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they would say that to their people before they invested, like, oh, you're too scattered. I need an entrepreneur who's only focused on one thing. And I used to be like, man, I've never focused on one thing, like not since I was three years old, right? Yeah. Um, I used to be like, gosh, what's wrong with me? And what I've learned about myself, being honest about who I am, is I thrive in an environment where I have multiple projects going on. And not only that, but I am very, very good at taking disparate sets of information and synthesizing them into an outcome, which means that when I went back to Columbia to get an MBA and was simultaneously writing my book, wow, did they have amazing cross-pollination and made both experiences better. Mm -hmm. And that's just who I am. I'm someone who does that and does it well and enjoys that process. Other people would make their head pop off like a daffodil, right? So it's, it's all about, you know, be honest about who you are. Try not to listen to Shark Tank and whoever else is telling you there's only one way to do things because there isn't one way to do things. It doesn't exist. It's why I don't give advice. <laughs> it's why you don't give advice. I, I, I'm, when I went through the EO training and learned about that method, I was like, this is interesting. There's something to this. And yet, um, I, I've seen the chart, right? Advice makes makes you have ego, puts you on top, makes them inferior. Like I've seen the chart and yet something still within me goes, I don't like, my advice is so nuanced and so carefully considered. And I give typically three options and then make a Rico for the one that I think might be best, but I give them options. Um, surely I'm so good at this that I I trust myself more than me telling them a story and them coming to their own conclusion. <laughs> Do you not bump into that or did I just not learn that method properly? I mean, listen, you could actually be the best advice giver of all. There could be a couple of things that are true, right? A, you may genuinely be someone who can't stop yourself, right? In which case, okay, fine. It's part of who you are. B, maybe you do have a methodology to do this in a way that people respond to and appreciate and so on and so forth. Um, I've just, what I've learned about people, Mark, and this is only through coaching, hundreds of entrepreneurs that have figured this out is people are on their own journey at their own pace. And there are people who ask for the answer and want the answer. And there are people who ask for the answer and they already know the answer. And I've tried to get very, very wise about which it is. And so when someone asks me for advice, one of the first questions I'll say is, what do you really, what do you really mean? Or what do you think the answer is? And if they give me the answer, I'll be like, oh, you know what? You're right. Do that. Because they're going to do that no matter what I say, right? <laughs> they're looking for validation of what they already think. Yes. This is like, you talk about, we talked about next level stuff, right? This is the next level of thinking in your interactions, okay? Others are like, no, really, I have no idea what to do. And I'll say, okay, well, what are the odds if I told you to, you know, the answer to your problems is to go jump off a bridge? You know, what are the odds you're actually going to listen to the advice I have to give? And they'll be like, oh, I don't know. I have to weigh it and I'm not sure. That's telling me they're afraid and mm -hmm. unsure. And they're in the information gathering phase. I'm going to go story, right? But if they say, Peter, literally, I will do anything you say because I know you've done it. I've decided I trust you. I've talked to other people you've worked with and I know this works. So I'm looking for a path. Okay, great. If I were you, I would do this, 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 this. Here's why I would do this. Here are the checkpoints that I would look for. And that is what I would do. I'm not saying that's what mm. you should do. That is what I would do if I were in your shoes. I love that. So I have that system, right? And I, I love what, it. I, what I want, right? Don't adopt my system. I mean, you can steal it. I won't go after you if you want, <laughs> but have your own system. Don't just react. You know, that's not honest to be like, oh, this person wants my advice. Whoa, look at me. Here's my peacock feathers. I'm going to tell... Don't, please don't do that, people, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm. Do you think people have more trouble being honest with themselves or honest with others? I think people have tremendous trouble being honest with themselves and therefore they have trouble being honest about others. Hmm. Everyone gets the honest with other people. They just typically struggle with it. They don't want to be offensive. 
mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want to lose a friend, whatever it is. Um, but the, it, because they're not honest about themselves and their own psychology, they fail to get honest about, about others. Um, mm. And they're judging themselves, so they're judging others. They're misunderstanding themselves, so they're misunderstanding others. And that's a really dangerous um, reflection zone that, that I hope the book dislodges people from and makes them more thoughtful, give them a rubric to ask more thoughtful questions. Hey, tell me more about that. You know, try to get out of some of the habits that make for that really nasty feedback loop. Hmm. And, and the reason I ask that is because, you know, per, perhaps you can identify with this. You know, I started my company so early and so young and I knew what I wanted at the time more than anything was I wanted to build something bigger than myself. I knew that I had a lot of limitations. And every time I hired someone amazing, it was like I was, I was throwing money at unlocking this brand new potential, right? It's like, I could, and then I realized, oh, I could, I could hire up experience. I could hire, like, I could just literally hire these, these, these gaps that to me were weaknesses, but that I could hire them up. And it was just really, really exciting. But I built a company and I built a system with, without the care that I probably should have just because I didn't know. And I found myself one day with this thing that, may, that, that forced me to be someone that I was not. And now I've spent the last few years trying to untangle that um, and restructure and make changes or whatnot. But I still feel like it's my duty to my company and to my team and to the client and the vision to be a certain person, to, you know, be present at certain times, to respond in certain ways, to do all of these things that I should do to be the person that I need to be to run the company that I, that I built. Um, and so when I hear you say, you know, like, what type of day would you want to have? What type of life would you want to have? Um, not only does it feel incredibly selfish for me to go like, oh, you know, like, this is where I'm at my best. And this is where I'm at my peak, even though I know that in five years or 10 years, it will take me so much further than, than where I am now. Um, it's still that, that getting honest with myself. I don't know if it's a problem, but then it's, what do we do with that honesty? Because now I need to go out to the people. I need to go, I need to restructure things. I need to make hard decisions. I need to do all of these things now that I've been honest with myself to build the business, to build the life, to build all of those things. Um, that's why I was asking a little bit earlier about the actions. So let's talk about that. Yeah, because, because I'm here right now and I've been here for, for a few years as I detangled myself from the thing that I built. Yep. Okay. So I want to go back to a, a comment I heard you say about being selfish, right? Because it's mm-hmm. a really interesting point and viewpoint. There are very few things that we can control in life. Ironically, most people try to control the things that they have no control over, right? Other people, extenuating circumstances, and they fail to control the things they can control, which are their own thoughts, reactions, and actions. Isn't that weird, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you ask me, is it selfish? No, I think what's selfish is not controlling the things that you have a responsibility to control and trying to control things you have no control over. That is not only selfish, but but I would classify as dishonest, right? I mean, listen, similar, Mark, right? We built a company that had offices and three states and two countries and tons of employees. And I used to walk in to my headquarters and I would like feel weird. I I didn't like particularly want to say hi to anybody. And I'm like, I don't know. I just want to go to my desk and do my work. And I was like, this is driving after vacation, driving in the morning after vacation with a going like, Oh, I don't know if I really want to show up. Right. And I'm like, what kind of weird feeling is this? Like I did it. I built a company with locations and international and this and that. I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? Why, why isn't this great? You know? And I really had to, to do some honest soul searching. And, you know, I realized I had built the company that I thought society thought was awesome. Right. Mm. And I didn't even like it. Like I d- listen, I got pissed off last week cause I had to put on pants. I'm not a pants kind of guy. I don't want to put on pants. <laughs> like, COVID for me. This is fantastic. I'm like, Oh, I get to work from home. Not talk to anybody. Lemon except shorts on all camera. day, every day. Right. It's phenomenal. You know, I've got my favorite sweatpants or I'm outside, you know, whatever. So, you know, I, I had to be honest with myself about, okay, what did I build? What do I really want? And then came action time. Right. And the, you know, luckily, luckily I had mentors who had different structures for businesses. And I really got to see it. And they they started to talk about like the holy grail, right? Small team, (laughs) everything outsourced, a lot more profitable, less work for the owner. And I was like, 
well, that doesn't make sense, but it isn't big company the thing. And, and I really had to unlearn some of that. And then I had to really look into the culture and into the people, right? And ask myself, how are my feelings and outlooks interrupting this group of people that I have assembled underneath me, right? Mm. Because there were grumblings of people like, yeah, Peter, he's not social enough. Peter, he's not this and not that. And here's the thing, like, Mark, if that's really who I, who I am, then I'm not going to change who I really honestly am, right? Which means I built something that's out of alignment with myself. It's just like a car, okay? If the car is out of alignment, it's not going to run well. It doesn't matter how many oil changes you get. It's just not going to run well, right? So it's up to us to put it back into alignment because either we as the owners are leaving or we're restructuring the company. And now I have a small team of people. They're incredible. We we're all on the same page. If they're listening, please don't leave because I love you all. Um, <laughs> and I, I really built, you know, a company that, that I'm proud of and that I love to work in. And that's the thing I have control over. Why wouldn't I exercise control over that? And by the way, the people who are still here are happy because they share the same values and they, you know, so yeah. it's all, it all works together if we're just honest enough about what we really need to do. Are you an INTJ? Uh, EN. I think I'm an ESTJ. An ESTJ. Interesting. Okay. I was, I was just curious because I'm not, you know, at one point I went down the Myers-Briggs rabbit hole like most people did. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, was, I was just curious because, you know, our stories seem very similar. And yeah. um, I'm an INTP, which, is, uh, which w was funny because when I was looking up the different, you know, entrepreneur, you know, the, the profiles who are most likely to be entrepreneurs, I was actually last. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> least likely, you know, not, not, um, you know, uh, not super good with people, not super understanding, somewhat impatient, you know, able to connect um, abstract thoughts together, move very, very quickly, don't want to take the time to explain anything. <laughs> so <laughs> when I heard grumblings from my team that you're not social enough, I thought, I thought this guy must be an introvert. <laughs> I, well, I think I am like a closeted introvert, right? You know, what's interesting is I love making, I love doing keynotes. You put a thousand people in the audience, I don't care because to me, they're one blob and I'm just talking to myself, right? Mm -hmm. But in a situation where I have like five or seven people, I'm like, Ugh, I don't want to like, I'll just sit and listen, right? I love it. I love it. So the, the one thing I will ask is because you know your stuff better than I do and I'm not egotistical <laughs> enough to suggest that, uh, that I do. What's the question that I should have asked that I didn't ask? Uh Gosh, I love that question too. And I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, if I were you, you know, I'd want to know how do you deal with like blatant uncertainty, right? Mm. We're living in a time where we don't know like what's going to happen this winter to our entire planet, right? We have all these big things hanging over us like uh, global warming and you know, all these kind of big, th and again, you know, no matter where you stand on any of these issues, it's like, this is what's being talked about, right? We have so much uncertainty in our daily lives. People have lost their jobs and all that. Like when you're confronted with that much doubt and fear, yeah, the question I would ask if I were you is like, where does honesty play into that, right? So where does honesty play into that? <laughs> Part of being honest and using honesty strategically is to think long-term. Folks get into trouble when they're making decisions for their day, week, month, even one year ahead and not making decisions for 25, 45, 65 years ahead. You know, we, we started talking about retirement, right? Now I started an IRA, 22. It's like the first thing I did. Um, and I, you know, I have to credit my parents. I think they were always long-term thinkers and probably encouraged me to do that um, because I, you know, aside from that, I have no idea where I got it. And when we see folks who have, this is the saddest thing, right? We see folks who have ended up in a place that they didn't ask for and they're su genuinely surprised. Wow, this isn't the way I thought my life was going to go, mm -hmm. right? We've all met those people and it's heartbreaking to me, right? And here's the thing. The where we are today, right now, is a reflection of everything we've done in the past, right? This, our present is always backward looking, which means that the actions we take today and tomorrow and the next day will ripple and compound 
over time into the future. Be honest with yourself. Like you fine. You don't want to open that blog today. You'd rather play PlayStation. Okay. You'll excuse that as it's just one day. It's just one hour, but that's not true. That's not honest. You know, just like money compounds, time, energy, vision, all of that compounds over time. So try as hard as you can, you know, to look beyond COVID-19, to look beyond, you know, some of the issues going on right now and look 20 years in the future. Who, you know, who do you want to be then? And we can all track towards that person with our actions right now. Peter, thank you so much, man. I really do appreciate talking to you. My pleasure. Thanks for being honest. Oh, man. I just love, I mean, first of all, I feel like I have a lot of similarities with Peter. There's, there's a lot of things that I recognize in him, but how honest and tactical was that conversation? You know, Peter's story helps me really come to understand how to leverage brutal honesty and just get comfortable with it. So, of course, the key takeaways for me, number one, when being honest with ourselves and with others, you just, you've got to ask the right questions so we can get to the honest answers. The right questions gives you honest answers and then you can make progress. Number two, we must honestly adapt along our ever-changing society. I mean, as we change, as we learn, as we grow as a society, we have to adapt or we're going to fall behind. And then number three, sometimes we think that we know everything. <laughs> I, fall, I fall into this trap. But being honest involves recognizing that we don't know everything all the time. Of course, all of these tips and this help only helps you if you actually put it into practice. I want to remind you, switching gears a little bit, I would love it so much. Please go over to Apple Podcasts, rate and review this. It would help us out so much. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to connect with me, reach out to me on IG directly, DM me, drop me a note. I would love to talk to you. Remember, those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to actually make it happen. But to do so, you have to think big. You've got to be bold. And finally, you know what? You must say yes. Yes.